so often when people are saved, you get different reactions. I remember many years ago, my very dear friend who lived at Salisbury, I was talking to him in our lounge and he had regrettably become quite liberal in his theology. He'd been to some sort of college which certainly didn't improve his understanding as it should have done. And like so many, it fed into a liberal way of thinking. And the word saved cropped up in my conversation. And he just said to me, well, it depends what you mean by saved. And I thought, oh no, here we go again. <laughs> and to me, there's only one thing about being saved. It's a two-sided thing. And that is, we are not only saved from something, we are saved too. And we have to keep our minds on both. If we ignore one, it gets, like many things, out of balance. One of the big problems when the words that Christians use are bandied about, they tend to uh, lose their sharpness, their really deep meaning. And one of the problems with the word saved is that very often people think, that's it, I've arrived. No, the journey's just started. That is a reality. We've just started a journey that will last the rest of our lives. We are part of God's people and he now has his time, his refining work to do. Being born again is not the end of God's work in us through Jesus Christ, our Lord, Saviour, Redeemer. It is the beginning of the new life. Life will never be the same again. The old life is finished. If we are born again, we have to keep in mind that our Lord has done everything that we need to enter this new spiritual life. And I'm going to just show you briefly from the scriptures, just to remind us, because I'm sure most people will know these scriptures well. That what I'm telling you is not an idea of mine. It is what God's word says, and that to me is paramount. Yes, being born again means we're in God's family. But there's something else that has happened. If you look in the King James Version, and the New King James for that matter, you will find in the epistle, first epistle of John, in chapter 2, it says, and he himself is the propitiation for our sins, and not for ours only, but also for the whole world. Now, I'm not criticising other translations which say something about the atonement in the fact that it is true. But what I get rather annoyed about is that in this particular place, it is quite clear that 
the epistle of John is telling us not about the atonement. He's talking about the propitiation. The problem is, in some dictionaries, even very good ones, they will give a range of meanings for this word. Now, I can honestly say, in ordinary conversations, in the whole of my life, the word propitiation has never cropped up. I know what it means. It means, in simple, general terms, to appease, to turn away somebody's wrath. And that is the meaning here. If you look in the Greek, it is quite clear. It is translated accurately in the Authorised Version and the New King James. That Jesus himself has turned away the wrath of God because of our sins. Ah, now, the question is, how did he do it? Well, he did it through the atonement. He became the perfect sacrifice. But it's not the sacrifice it's being talked about here. It's the fact that God's wrath has been turned away. Regrettably, over the latter half of the 20th century, the general fear of God, respect for God, the honour for God, had just been cast aside by the Western world. And their thinking was not only sloppy, but quite frankly, insulting to God. He is not man, scripture says. He is God. And the fear of God is something which we should cherish because it keeps things in perspective. Otherwise, we might end up going the same way. Earlier in this chapter 1, it says in verse 7, If we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship one with another. And the blood of Jesus, his son, cleanses us from all sin. So the apostle has already dealt with our salvation. So what is it that's really at the heart of what is being said in chapter 2. He's making it quite clear in the verses 8, 9 and 10 of chapter 1 that everything concerning our salvation has been done by Jesus. But it's this other aspect that not only are we in his kingdom but his perfectly justifiable anger, fury, call it what you like, that God is entitled to have simply because we sinned, it has been turned away. When we grasp that, we can understand uh, simple texts which tell us that our sins have been cast as far as away as from the east as from the west. To be remembered no more. I mean, these are tremendous verses. But to think that my heavenly Father has not only forgiven me, he's forgotten about my sins. He's not angry with me anymore. I first had this drawn to my attention by a a well-known Scottish evangelist. He's only a little man in height, but a mighty man in the scriptures. And he was just giving a, an illustration of when we feel 
convicted of something and that the enemy whispers in our ear, you're too bad for this. God couldn't forgive you. He continues the conversation and says, and my father will say, what, well, what's he done? He said, I don't know about it. And this is how great God's forgiveness is. This is a salvation into which we have entered already. But the point is, as our brother Alec Passmore once said many years ago, I can remember the title of his, his uh, address. It was, and the best is yet to come. So how do we get from where we are as saved people to being in God's kingdom? May I suggest to you that God has this refining work to do. And it's called sanctification. One thing is absolutely certain. And when I'm talking to people about salvation, I make it quite clear that whilst we're in this life, we are still fully human. We are still fallible. We will fail. But even if we go down, God will lift us up. Our Heavenly Father isn't here and wanting to beat us into submission. He wants us to go his way with a great desire for his way. And the question is, why? And it is simply this. The whole of what constitutes heaven, there is no sin. Scripture goes so far as to tell us that, uh, in effect, we don't need street lights because... God himself is our light. A lot of people think that when they go to heaven, for example, they may be very keen on golf. They'll be able to spend all day playing golf. Sorry, no. I have hobbies. I expect you have hobbies and interests. We won't need them there. To the unbeliever, the concept of worshipping God in church on a Sunday must be, oh no. To think of it as eternity and to understand what we mean by eternity, that it is forever. They must be thinking, oh dear. But that should be the Christian's desire. Mankind was made in the image of God. Mankind sinned. And mankind couldn't put the clock back, as it were, and pretend it didn't happen. I was thinking about it this week. As regards sin, what, what actually happened? Well, to me, everything in creation just went haywire, as we say. When Adam was placed in the garden, he was given a job to do. He wasn't given a deck chair and told just to sit and sun himself. He had a job to do. But have you noticed what it actually says? It was to tend the garden. There's no question about double digging and stuff like that, or sawing down trees. It was just a tent. I believe from what God's word tells us that everything, plants, animals, birds, fish, everything was completely in order. 
And from the moment sin entered into the human race, the whole thing went pear-shaped. Even to the things that weren't involved in it. The animals, the birds, the fish. Simply because sin affects everything. Other people, other situations. And I believe that that's the way it worked. I've often thought it's odd, isn't it? Having lived in India, where in the hot season, you didn't have green grass like we have out here. It was just burnt dry, parched. The only thing that seemed to grow around our way was rice. It's all right if you liked rice. But what else happened? Well, I'm not a gardener. My wife can tell you that. I'm not very good even on remembering what the names of plants are. And that includes weeds. Yeah. And sometimes, as I did this week, I had to call her over and say, um, basically, should this be growing here? Because I didn't know whether it was something she had planted or whether it was a weed. It looked very pretty. But there's one reason I asked, and that was that the things which are most prolific in my garden, or our garden, and I think everybody else's, are the weeds. I planted some new things, bought from the local nursery, just a few months ago. I think one of them is alive. <laughs> the rest, uh, I'm sorry, they have had it. I never have that trouble with weeds, though. I do have a trouble with trying to get them out. They always seem to have the biggest tap roots, the most prolific flowers, seeds which can scatter like that. And the old countryman saying, one year's seeds and seven years weeds. And living opposite a farm where they, they don't exactly mow it a lot. Uh, a lovely show of buttercups and occasional bit of oilseed rape. A ragwort, yes. But uh, it won't stay there. It has to come out and everybody else's gardens as well. But my flowers and Pat's flowers, uh, they sometimes struggle. And we have to go out and water them. Have you noticed you don't need to water weeds? It's like sin. This is why I am a very firm believer in the biblical account of the creation. I know there are plenty of people, even who call themselves Christians, who don't believe it. But to me, the pattern of what I see just outside, it fits exactly into what's happened. Some people don't even believe that Adam was a person. I can't do anything about it. I can't believe for them. I can't have faith for them. I can't save them. But I know that my Redeemer came down because of his great love and submitted himself to the indignity and abuse of all that went on at Calvary. And he did it out of his great love. Why? To redeem for himself a people who will honour God. If you look in Ezekiel, at one point, God is remonstrating with the Israelites. And twice in one chapter, he says this. He says, 
It's not for your benefit that I'm doing this. It's for the honour of my name. And the situation, friends, is still the same. God isn't some old man sat up on the clouds, benevolent, handing out little goodies. He's jealous for the honour of his name. And this is one of the reasons why God has got his refining work to do in our lives to prepare us for our time forever in his kingdom. The dominion of our sin, it causes a lot of problems, doesn't it? But Jesus has delivered us from the dominion of the sin if we'd only let him do his work in our lives. We see that in giving us his Holy Spirit, his word tells us that it was a guarantee, a deposit of the good things to come. And the Holy Spirit isn't there nine till five. He's there all the time, every day, for every believer. We've only just got to, to call out. But we need to be people who are submitted to what God wants. His guarantee, we read of this in 2 Corinthians uh, chapter 1, 2 Corinthians chapter 5, and Ephesians 1. We're justified by faith. We read that in Ephesians chapter 2. And the work of the Holy Spirit, his purifying work in us, is preparing us for the kingdom that will last forever. It will, it will go on for the rest of our earthly life. None of us are inherently righteous, no matter what some preachers like to tell us. None of us is inherently good. The word of God, which I trust, says the heart is evil, desperately wicked. And that is the true earthly nature. We all know that at heart. And if we deny it, we fool ourselves. So we need the Holy Spirit to keep us in doing what God wants, because it certainly doesn't come naturally to sinners like me. It's not natural to the human nature to want to go God's way because it means a life often of denial. But it's because of the union with Christ that we are a new creation as we see in 2 Corinthians 5.17. And there's one thing that's absolutely certain. There's no way, no question of sanctification being of our thoughts and efforts. Jesus told us in John 15 and verse 5 what man's problem was. Very simple. He said, without me, you can do nothing. You can do nothing. You're helpless. The faith we have is a gift from God. It's not our humanity at work. We see that in Ephesians 2, 8, and 8 to 10. We could put it like this. If there's no sanctification in our life, 
there's probably no true faith. Because without faith, nobody's going to want sanctification. Because it's a hard road. Nowhere in scripture does it say that going God's way is, if you like, just cruising along. No. We have a work to do. And there's a big work that God has to do in our lives. There was a well-known politician, I shan't mention a name, but it just shows you how deception can blind people. In the course of an interview one day, he said that he was a Christian, but not a practising one. And several years on, I'm thinking to myself, what was this man about? What does he think a Christian is? He might have been a very high political leader in this country, but he fools himself. There's only one kind of Christian, and that is one who is born again of the Spirit of God. Coming to church never saved anybody. You could bring your cat and dog. It doesn't make them a Christian. Salvation is by grace through faith, not of works. And it is as simple as that. So what about this new life? Well, scripture makes it clear. When we're born again, it isn't to improve our spiritual life. It's a new life, a new birth. We are transferred from Satan's kingdom to the kingdom of God. There's no middle way. It's quite simple. There are only two destinations when we're finished with this life. And time and again, I have to challenge people and say, where are you going? Do you know where you're going? It's a very serious matter. 2 Corinthians 5, 17 to 19 says that we are a new creation. We're not a patched up one. And included in all this is that we would be going God's way, not our own. And that means sanctification. Living a life God's way unto God. The sanctification is evidence of the indwelling of the Holy Spirit. And I would commend to you Romans chapter 8, verses 8 to 11. And it makes it very clear. So, there's an obligation. This sanctification isn't brought to us as a, an option, not an optional extra. It's an obligation. And sanctification does not replace justification. But God wants his people to be wholly committed to him. We find one of the best senses of describing this is in Deuteronomy chapter 6 and verses 4 and 5. What's the... Jewish people called the Shema and which orthodox Jewish men will recite every morning part of it says this you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart with all your soul and with all your strength that's some 
obligation. Because Romans 7 makes it quite clear that the Christian life is not an easy one. If I said it was easy, I would be lying to you. If I said it's difficult, I'd be misleading you. Because the truth is, in our own power, it's totally impossible. We can only live it through the work of the Holy Spirit working in us. To live as God intended us. It's all part of God's eternal plan and purpose. So at the end of this life, where is your destination? Where's mine? A lot of people, probably a very large number, are just hoping that they'll, they'll make it to get it into heaven. Sorry, if that's your view, you've missed it. You need to get right with God and repent because the message, the true message of the gospel starts with repentance, not with coming to church. We need the challenge of God's word daily. Otherwise, we may well stray. I would suggest that we treat our discipleship in this same way, an obligation. How many churches I've seen where there's no challenge to believers to live a sanctified life. I do wonder if they realise that part of being a disciple is actually to carry out the Master's wishes. Jesus in Matthew chapter 28 verses 19 and 20 told the disciples to go and make disciples, teaching them and baptising them. In John 13 and verses 34 and 35, Jesus laid down what were what we might call the hallmarks of the disciple. It's, it's quite clear, it's not arguable. what they should be like in character. He also told them the message they had to preach. Now, Jesus himself was the truth, the way, the life. And in Acts 1 and verse 8, it says, if we are believers, that there is this power available to us through the Holy Spirit. In this particular case, it was when the Holy Spirit was going to come at Pentecost. But that Holy Spirit is still available to us. Why do we need the Holy Spirit? Well, the answer's in that verse, verse 8. It says, But you shall receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you. Without the Holy Spirit indwelling us, we lack the power. It's as simple as that. But there's one thing I would draw your attention to. And that is when Jesus told the disciples to go out. He never said please. Now, some people might think, well it's a 
A bit blunt and rude, isn't it? No. It was a command. And you may have noticed in that portion that I read of the Shema, it was the same. There's no asking you to do it. It's telling you what you should do. That you should love the Lord with all your heart, etc. Politeness doesn't come into it. It is a requirement. And why is the message from so many pulpits in the Western world at variance with what you will hear even from the poorest preachers in Southeast Asia. Completely different message. So many of the churches have just become plain sloppy. They ignore God's word and they substitute the ideas of men. They'd rather be concerned about global warming and wind farms than they would about the breath of the spirit. It's as simple as that. I'm not saying there's anything wrong with wind farms. I think they're a horrible sight, but that's another matter. But we've got to get our electricity from somewhere. But you know what I'm talking about. Churches are getting involved in social things and worldly things, which as private individuals they may want to, but it's got nothing to do with faith in the almighty God Amen. who demands, not begs, demands obedience. That is with who on with whom we deal. And we have to wake up to that. One of the other problems that occurs in the Western churches very carefully crafted sermons. I'm not opposed to that at all. But. <laughs> carefully crafted so that they don't offend anybody. Well, you won't get that from me. Never mind my background. I say things as they are. I tell you what the word of God says. I'm not interested in men's opinions. Why should I be? God isn't interested in them. He's not interested in my opinions. He wants my obedience. And how often I let him down. And it's like this continuous situation during our life. And it's only through this sanctification that we can be put back in the right way. Friends, part of our sanctification should be that of bringing the true gospel message to people. And to do that, we need the Holy Spirit to help us, to fill us. In Jeremiah chapter 23, in verse 29 says is not my word like a fire and like a hammer that breaks the rock in pieces yet the message so often heard does not even challenge people never questions the life that we live It's frequently a call to come to our church. They're such nice people. Friends, God didn't send Jesus just to save nice people. He came to save sinners like me. And if we don't wake up to that, then the world outside isn't going to take any notice. The world outside needs to know that God is still in complete control. 
all the pandemonium and violence and everything that's going on in the world, he knows all about it. And he not only knows all about it, he's known all about it since before the world was created. That is the God we deal with. And we ignore him at our peril. The thing is that Jesus came with one purpose. And you can find it very clearly in Luke chapter 19 and verse 10. Jesus said that he had come to seek and save that which was lost. And the importance of spreading the word, you can read also in Mark 1 and verse 38, where they were going to move on to another town. Jesus' message was not to touch the righteous, but to touch the sinner, to make the sinner a forgiven sinner and to be fit for God's kingdom. In John chapter 12 and verse 44, to 50. Jesus says, the father who sent me gave me a command. What I should say and speak and his command is everlasting life. Therefore, whatever I speak, just as the father has told me, so I speak. If we are his disciples, we should obey his commands. We need the fire of God in our lives, not humanistic efforts. We need to be full of the spirit of God and to face down this evil world and the people who are perpetuating evil and enjoying doing it not having a thought for God at all. And the violence and all the criminality that's going on, all the ungodly things that are going on. And some preachers tone down what they say. Why? Because they don't want to offend anybody. It was made quite clear in scripture that the message of the cross is an offence to so many, the majority. But it was through the cross that our salvation was made available. If we really are walking in obedience to our Lord, we should have that desire for people to hear the word. It's part of our preparation for being in God's kingdom. I urge us not to flag in zeal, may we constantly seek the Lord to live sanctified lives to his honour and glory. May we always seek to walk God's way. And it means taking our sanctification seriously. Amen. <laughs>